ultimately that we need to understand what's the saying that if things were not the way that they were, they wouldn't be the way that they are. So that's just, I think, in order for us to have to move forward in this uh, regenerative space and for to create more or cultivate more of a regenerative uh, industry, I think we have to go start from the beginning and understand that for us, like Mika was saying, what it meant for cotton and indigo and what that meant for us. And we have to change our relationship with the outdoors, you know, with our environment. I think that there is kind of a stigma between, you know, farmers and growing and you think of, you know, slavery, but that's when they have told us that that, that was our genesis. They didn't go back, you know, to when we were in our native lands and how important um, a weave was or when we wore certain um, things for different types of ceremonies and when we wore certain um, accessories and had markers and we had um, we told the story about ourselves and our tribes and our cultures and where we're from through our clothing through our accessories through um, the things that we wore and I think that when we tap back to that being the genesis versus starting as slaves being the genesis that it has a different type of perception and we can honest, honestly look at our clothing and hold them a little bit more valuable when we understand, hey, this is my grandmother's soap. This is my whomever's, um, you know, pants, as Sina was saying, you know, when we understand the value is in the experience that those threads or um, has had and not necessarily in the name that's written across the chest or the or even if it is the name that's written on across the chest who that is and what that represents. I think that's the only way we're gonna to start to begin to change the way that we feel about clothing is when we're on the runway and we're not asking who are we wearing, but you know, what's special about what we're wearing. Um, you know, when we talk about the cloths and how we have kente and what that means and the different types of symbols, symbologies that's put on clothing. Um, when we talk about, you know, wearing the wrap versus wearing it across, when we talk, when we actually have clothing that means something to us, when people put that fascia bag on it and people recognize that people know this person is responsible, they're about the environment. When they put that Telfar bag on, when they put, when they slip into your um, denim, Miko, I think that is when we can really start to value the clothing that we have. Then it doesn't just become throw away because you got it for $5.99. If that's the only thing that you can brag about, about the things that you're wearing, then what does that say about you ultimately? Not necessarily if you can't, if that's what you can afford, that's what you can afford. But there's also $5.99 alternatives. That doesn't necessarily always have to mean, you know, H&M or whatever, but I think just even, you know, what people call hand-me-downs, what I like to call hand-me-overs, even that is something that's very special. Um, so wherever, wherever it is that you're wearing or wherever it is that you are, I think we just have to change the narrative, the Genesis narrative of not necessarily beginning with the slavery and having this um, torturous or this, you know, laborious um, idea of what it meant to when you hear cotton I think for a lot of people when you hear cotton it kind of makes them cringe a little or indigo but when you hear you know about kente cloth when you hear about wearing ceremonial garb when you hear about you know the waist beads and the reasons why behind you do um you wear the things that you wear you know when you wear hijab when you wear all of these things I think that is what's going to change the cultures shift the cultures when we're proud of the experiences that our clothes had versus um you know the the what has been told has been lux for us you know these these Paris Parisian and French fashion houses which we have no resignation with at all it's not in our culture at all um so I think we we just need to change the story, the narrative behind the clothing, and then we will hold it more valuable or something like that. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm definitely going to echo what Akilah said. Um, I mean, <clears throat> when you think about the vision, especially when you're thinking about a collective vision, right? For me, I always think about, so what are the barriers to progress, right? If, for me, I, I, I'm always thinking like in a very systems theory type of way. So what are the pillars to the system that optimizes white supremacy and unsustainability and unregenerative practices? I categorize it into education, public policy, and marketing, and it all boils down to power dynamics. And those power dynamics 
boils down to who has been controlling the narrative, how and why. And so in order for us, I guess this spills from the other question as well, but if if the goal is to if the goal is liberation and regeneration, we we have to understand how the system operates, right? We have to understand um, all of the different mechanisms that are in place. But also, we have to understand who the how, like how have we been doing it right for generations? How have we been doing it so beautifully for generations? Which is shameless plug. I um, partnered with this uh, podcast entity called Conscious Chatter um, to create a five or six part podcast series that's focused on decolonizing the sustainable fashion agenda, where we brought in educators and artists and policymakers and community activists to all reframe and they're all black and brown folks Akila and Miko were both on the podcast so that we can be re-educated to begin the process of reframing our understanding of Genesis stories and begin to reframe um, the narrative of who have been doing this shit in the best way possible right as Kila mentioned um you know the the genesis of sustainability was on the continent whether we're talking about linens in egypt you know whether we're talking about quilts that were made in zambia whether we're talking about various flax seeds garments in south africa did all of this and and translating that into indigo and miko's amazing story and and historical anecdotes to, to how denim um came into the marketplace like we have to divest from the scarcity thinking and the linear narratives that have been put into place and we have to actually be proactive in re-educating ourselves on um and re-educating and disrupting and challenging information on on who have been sustainable how and why so that we can begin to think alternatively and regenerative, regeneratively and next is build institutions. For me, that's a huge goal is, is creating circular institutions where we hold, um, where we hold a different type of power than we were ever able to hold uh, before, right? Creating new markets, and, and again, I, I know I'm talking very business oriented, but there's also a spiritual intellectual aspect as well that is very much rooted in sustainability and regenerative thinking. But, but the goal, the, the, old, the ultimate vision is integrated ecosystems that we own and operate. That, and that means doing a lot of restoration and that means creating new and viable toolkits um that look very circular and is focused on community building that's focused on farming that's focused on waste management that's focused on comprehensive programming that's focused on our own committees that we have created that's focused on different ways in which we use technology and research and things of that nature so it's re again i i, I just can't reiterate how much of us needing to understand that we are the blueprint and figuring out the modern version, you know, putting, you know, we talk about ancestry a lot, but like putting ancestry in modern times and all the, you know, the, still be cool and hip and all that shit and, and recreating and re reaffirming um, a blueprint that makes sense for today. So yeah, I don't know, just like Keila said, shit, I don't know. <laughs> Can I can I just continue that crazy Oakland flow over to Harlem real quick? Yay! Can I just, 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 it's the bridge. It's the bridge. You the know? bridge. It's the, it's the bridge. It's the bridge. Bringing us all baby. together That's from the east to the west. From the That's east to the need. west. Let's go. Can I, can, first, we are the blueprint. that that comment alone when we understand that we will never be eliminated because we are the blueprint print we are the creative capital we are the creative currency we are the innovators educators engineers uh 
uh, influence, whatever you want, everything that be, the beginning of everything existed, that if the, the true role is tried to eliminate us, will eliminate them. If we talk about us versus them, there is no us versus them because we are the beginning of everything that exists. So the story, period. <laughs> so the story of when we talk about even the story about enslavement, that is a that is a the way that it has been told has been a mechanism to keep our minds at bay, to keep us feeling in a space of low energy. But part of why I've been talking about the story of enslavement and its connections to indigo is to retell a story and to hold our community accountable, not just our community, but the greater community, the American community accountable to retell a story that is beyond, uh, you know, so for instance, let me, let me express this. The essential denim pieces that we know as essential denim pieces in American denim, the trucker jacket, the denim shirt, the crop jean, the overall, the coverall, all were fashioned on the plantations in the American South. There is there's actual documents that show an article um, saying, look to your local Negro for this, this, this particular look. On the, and, the, and it's an illustration of a woman on a plantation and then a white woman wearing the look. It is in fashion, we have fashioned these on the American plantation. We were not taken here because we were, oh, whoa, like, you know, we didn't know anything. It, we were taken because cotton inherently grows in Africa. We were, we knew how that seed worked. We understood how indigo worked. We were taken for our ingenuity and our excellence and our and and knowing how to engineer and create systems, much like George Washington Carver. That was in his DNA. This is not something that is. That's why we need to reframe the narrative, as Dominique has said. Reframe the narrative. This is not about us talking about you know. Oh, whoa, we were beaten on the plants. No, we were brought here because of our ingenuity, because of who we are and what we brought. And let's not forget that the Native Americans were not white. They were black indigenous people. There were many of us that had been traveling across the planet and making this place home and began a lot of the industry here. So when I talk about paying homage to black indigenous American Native Americans and enslaved Africans on my site, I'm talking about us. You know, the land was taken from us. The land all up and down the coast was taken from us and given to the white Native American uh, 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 ancestry when really it was ours. My grandmother was born in Native American Cherokee Indian in the Cherokee Mountains, grew up in the Cherokee Mountains in South Carolina. Everybody She's ain't ready for that realization, Miko. Everybody got, ain't ready for that level That level of realization. It's not common I, knowledge. It's what I'm doing. Don't matter. You have to tell the truth. Tell the truth. I've got to tell the truth. I got to tell the truth. That's I got to tell the truth. So when we when we really understand that, then we understand we can never be eliminated. When there's a video on my website, we posted the link. When I showed that video, when we did our fashion presentation, we have partners in Pakistan that help make our product. The reason why this multi-million dollar facility who makes clothing for big, huge, huge like Zara and H&M, they make, they, came behind my small brand because when the workers saw the story, which when I went to Pakistan, they look exactly like us. They, they looked at me and said, you my sister. Cause they are all, all of our complexions. Everybody that's on this panel, they're the same color as us. So when they saw me, they were like, you're my sister. And when, they, when the workers saw it, they said, this is us, this is our story. We can relate to this. So it's important when we we have a very different perspective as Black Americans on this planet. Black America, anybody that's been raised in America, Black America, whether you're a Haitian descent or Caribbean descent, because I have Caribbean descent too, Native American, whatever, we have a very different 
very different path and a very different trajectory and a very different perspective because we are amalgamation of many different cultures and we can speak across the lines on many different ways. And so for us, when we speak and when we understand who we are, we magnify, we magnify the globe. We magnify the globe. And the, what is so important in the work that we're doing is to, for people to, for the young people, we can never stop telling this history. We need to be amplifying George Washington Carver and everyone else every day. We can never stop telling this history. We have to continue to document it and pass it forward and pay it forward to the generations to come. And that's our work to be done. And when we understand that, then we can understand, as I said, as Dominique said, we are the blueprint. And to add to we are the blueprint, we can never be eliminated. Point blank, mm -hmm. period. No, that's real. Everybody, I just put the link to that podcast I was talking about where Miko and Akila are and, and 15 or, or 16 other phenoms. Please go listen to that if you're into sustainability, if you're into fashion, um, if you're into disrupting mainstream discourse and relearning exactly what Miko is uh, speaking about, please. Oh, wow. I swear, I'm going to have to rewatch this recording like a few times because it's just like, and it's like bars. It's like, I don't even need to listen to a song. Like I can just listen to y'all talk like all day. <laughs> like every single like word that comes out of each of your mouths. Like I'm just, I just want to say, I'm just so honored. Like I'm, I'm literally so honored to be here right now to be moderating to be listening to all of you um just uh, I'm just so honored to be a part of this Tuskegee family I went to Howard University I didn't go to Tuskegee um this this relationship happened through Hustlers to Harvesters through our through our extension in UDC that actually failed us um, and we're building bridges with their extension, even though we're in, even though I'm based in DC, but um, that this happening was all in alignment. It's all very divine. Um, I remember just like writing in my book and the, the conversations we're having, just every, all these thoughts, like really putting that out there in the universe. And then the fact that it has came back, I'm thinking I'm gonna be sitting in a panel like this, like 10, 20 years from now and it happened within the two years and I'm just blown away like I'm just so in awe and I'm just so thankful shout out to Carver what a pioneer and what it means to be a pioneer because we're all pioneers in this like in this foundation that we're building it's so hard to even have conversations like this and really dig deep into really what we really need to be talking about what we really need to be doing instead of just having like surface you know, conversations and just like surface solutions. And we're really digging deep. And this is what the ancestors have called us here to do. And I'm just, again, just so blessed and thankful to be here. Um, and now we're gonna open it up for um, the Q&A. I haven't really, I've been seeing the chat go off and shout out to everybody. And oh my God, these conversations I already see. Um, but if any anybody has a question that they want to ask you can raise your hand um as i look through this chat How do I oh, yeah. i'm sorry candle okay i'm looking at okay so candle i see your raise um i just had a I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Tondi, because this is your idea, and these women are phenomenal, and y'all are amazing, and thank you so much for sharing this energy. Um, my question is, and, and you all started to touch on it with fast fashion, right? Um, you know, Kanye West, I'm from Chicago, so I have this totally biased love for Kanye West, right? I know, crazy, terrible, trash almost, but um, when it comes down to creativity and just being an artist and growing and changing, right, I truly believe one of the best and one of, um, especially coming from Chicago, somebody to look to, right? I, I, I love and appreciate that. And when I reflect on his conversation on Sway in the morning, he, you don't have the answer Sway when he was going off about, you know, the fashion industry, that's, 
the conversation that he was having, he was upset because he didn't have access to the supply chain that Gucci, Louis Vuitton, um, Versace, that they had colonized their way into owning essentially, right? And so he just talked about wanting to create wanted to create quality things at affordable prices for his people, right? And now here I, here I find myself a young entrepreneur, right? I'm not in the fashion industry, but I love everything that has to do with agriculture. And for me, as a farm plug, right, I like to use things and places and events to connect people to agriculture to expand their mind. And um, I, find, I keep finding myself in, in this weird space where I see my peers um, they flipping t-shirts and they going crazy with it. And I'm like, damn, I could just put a little logo on a t-shirt and be getting my money up. And then, but then I, 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 the same way that you said, Miko, I've been to China. I've seen sweatshops, you know, I've seen, you know, people who look like me in, uh, in, in slave conditions today and tell myself that I can't contribute to that. So what advice would you have? for um, young entrepreneurs or anyone who, you know, is in a lower resource or intentionally under-resourced community that is interested in, you know what I'm saying, doing an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial thing and spreading messages through, you know, fashion and the things that we wear on our bodies, but don't want to contribute to that um, slave supply chain that you all are so beautifully circumventing and, and poking, shooting. I'm talking about y'all shotgunning holes through that thing. So, um, you know, I just be wanting to, put my little farm plug on the t-shirt without feeling bad and enslaving my brothers and sisters somewhere else. So if you have any advice for that, and even what I could tell my peers, right, um, in terms of better ways to go about um, spreading their messages, um, please do share. I would say continue to be as creative as possible. Um, as Akula said, use your reach what's around you. You don't have to buy new t-shirts. I mean, it might be just dope to be able to you know, there's many different ways. There's there's the way of being able to buy uh, a lot of what the work that we do is by dead stock. And dead stock, I mean, is we get the the fabric that is sample yardage um, that they're never going to make any more of, and use that in our product line because it's just fabric that's 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 sitting in the in the mill. Um, also, you know, thrift stores are an incredible way. I mean, what happens at the Goodwill, I'm sure Akila could speak to this, a lot of what is what becomes land becomes landfill in other countries like Haiti, because it's, you know, people are thinking they're donating their stuff to the Goodwill and actually it's being just dropped off in other countries and becoming their land problem. Um, and so if there's ways that we can circumvent that and being able to find a solution in, in the work that you're doing, I think that's an, an incredible way to do, you know, your t-shirts. And if you really, it, is it, t you should ask yourself, is it really t-shirts that you want to make? Because I know that's the entryway. And a lot of people say, oh, I want to make a t-shirt. Is that really what it is? And if you want to do something outside of t-shirts and you have reached a person like one of us or someone else, you know, people slide in DMs for lesser. So slide in the DM, talk to us, send us an email or do this or whatever and ask us, you know, hey, do you have contacts around this? You know, maybe we don't actually do that work, but maybe we can put you in, uh, connect you with someone that knows that. But really think about what's the product you want to put out, you know, because to truth be told, there were, I, I started, this was my fourth company. I have two companies that actually are running outside of Oak and Acorn is this one. And then I have a, a, a consulting company. But when you think about, you know, what it is that you actually want to do, really take a take a hard look about what you want to do and what you want to put out because you don't have to start with a t-shirt just because that's the easy route can i can i jump in i don't know how to put the hand up <laughs> so can uh, i just go ahead and, um can i go ahead okay yeah yeah okay well i just want to um first of all just say congratulations this was a very 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 powerful presentations and I'm very uh, proud of you all for having um, thought so deeply about the work that you're doing and um, really um, capturing uh, some very, very important aspects, you know, from the historical and the cultural and the economic. It really is, um, it really is holistic, um, which, you know, you have said. Um, and each of you made some very powerful points um, when, um, I think, Miko, when you talked about the, the blue, the indigo, um, 
you all probably know that this the second chakra is indigo, right? It's that deep, deep blue. So that color is is not only is it beautiful just to look at. I mean, all the colors are beautiful, but uh, that indigo is mystical, and it has a lot to do with the melanin <laughs> and the pineal gland and and all of that. So to work with that and to wear that. Um, is, is pretty amazing. Um, and I think clothing in and of itself is so much more than what people realize. You know, I mean, it, it is probably the deepest expression of who you are. I mean, you can look at people and what they're wearing and get an idea of what they think, <laughs> what they believe and who they are and what they're trying to be, you know. Um, the, the the whole thing about regenerating or uh, re being generative, uh, regenerative, you know, and, and you talked about the historical and I'm connecting that with Sankofa, you know, that you, we, you go back and you bring forward the, that aspects that are of importance, the things that we want to continue to move forward. So I think sometimes we need to just take what we already have and market that. You know, I mean, there was a time period when the Sankofa was come, showing up everywhere, you know, the concept, the idea, the word itself. And now it, you know, things become so trendy in today's world and in today's society. So I think we have to continue to use those things um, and to just really, really understand the depths of who we are is probably the most important thing that we can do. And to do that in every industry, you know, is what's going to help to move us forward as a people. So I have a question. Um, what, what is your opinion of um, how clothing, um, or let's say the scadly dress clothing or the very sexually seductive clothing um, and how that is, um, you know, promulgated and, you know, all you see so much of it on the housewives, all the different shows and whatnot. Um, I'd like to know um, what you all think about that. And in what ways do you um, try to address it or not? Is it important? Does it matter? Um, I would like to start on that. And um, like I said, my parents are on the line, so I, I'm sure my father can attest <laughs> to what I'm about to say. Um, one, I definitely believe in the liberation and the freedom of expression through clothing, period. I do believe what is currently happening, though, is just an abuse of power, just like an abuse of power anywhere else. Um, just the same way we see violence and gun shooting, and a, that's a type of power that we see too much of. It's the same with the scantily clad women. There is a power in the feminine. There is a power in showing um, to the erotic, not the, no, I'm sorry, in, in the erotic and there's just being an abuse of that. They know that it's, uh, they're using it for a reason. It's not just out there just for the sake of expression. It's not just out there for the sake of um, liberation. It's an abuse of power, just like we're seeing way too many other things, like I mentioned, you know, um, violence, sexual acts. It's a powerful notion to dress in that way and to show the female form. And I just think ultimately they're abusing it. Might I add, um, you said it eloquently, Akila, absolutely. And the way that I approach it is, I feel like um, Ms. Shakir, when you talked about you know our chakras and the connection, the spiritual connection, I also feel that, and this is this is what I, when I'm meditating or when I receive, um, uh, I, I hear that there's an energy that's being, you know, echoed in the atmosphere, right? And you know, while we understand the divine feminine, that we we grew up from, we come from matriarch, a matriarch, matriarchal uh, culture, but this is a patriarchal society, and what's happening is we're coming into awareness of the divine feminine. But where we are in this country, America as a young country has always been the great marketer. 
And so everything that comes into the energy space of America gets overexploited. And so when we are not on par with our energy systems, when we are not in alignment, as you talked about our chakras, when we're not in alignment, the first uh, uh, entry point is a low vibration and it operates from the waist down. And so what we're seeing is a sexualization and abuse of power.